Welcome back everybody to another reaction video continuing with our look into Epic History TV series on the Napoleonic Wars. We're kind of, we're getting pretty close to the end now, so uh, only a few more videos to go, but there's been a few people um, requesting that I do the Epic History TV video on Napoleon's Marshals after this one, which um, I will definitely line up on the schedule to come just after this series. I think we might as well keep that momentum of Epic History TV going and just do um, all the videos that they have on the Napoleonic Wars um, that I can uh, offer reactions to. So I'll definitely do the Marshalls one after that. So if you're one of the few people that have requested that, uh, rest assured it's, it is on the schedule and it will come. Um, we're looking at Wellington's Triumph, um, which was the Battle of Vittoria, which was the sort of Waterloo of the Peninsula War, so to speak. It was the battle that basically broke French control of um, Spain. So we'll be looking at that today. Um, just a couple of things, as always, before we start. If you like what I do, please leave a like and a comment. There's been a um, fantastic response to this series uh, from all of you people watching. Um, picked up so many new subscribers from doing this series. Um, so if you're one of the new subscribers uh, that have come from watching this, uh, welcome to the channel. Please definitely take a look at the other episodes of the Amateur Historian Reacts that I've done. Um, just a couple of updates. There is um, the... Uh, original content coming shortly. I don't know if it will be up by the time I get this video up, because obviously I do record these ahead of time, so I'm not too sure on the scheduling and things like that. Um, it might be up, it might not be, um, but if it's not, it will be up soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if you want to support the channel, please subscribe, make sure notifications are on. There's reaction videos every Wednesday and Friday. Um, the, like I say, they are recorded ahead of time, so if you do suggest anything, um, it, I will get to it. It may just take a while. If you want to support the channel a bit further, then um, there is also a link to Patreon in the description of the video, so please definitely uh, check that out too. The more support I get in that sense, the more videos I'll be able to do, because it, this will become a job for me, So, um, which is... Um, one of my aims, you know, I would love to do this um, as a job, as a full-time job, so that would be fantastic. So please definitely check that out for me too. Um, but let's just dive straight in. So this is Epic History TV, um, Wellington's Triumph, the Battle of Vittoria, 1813. May 1813. While Napoleon's Grande Armée began its fight back in Central Europe following the disastrous invasion of Russia, 1,200 miles away, at the other end of Napoleon's embattled empire, another enemy was poised to strike. The previous year, Wellington's Anglo-Portuguese army had won a brilliant victory at Salamanca, but been held at Burgos and forced into a long, demoralizing retreat back to the Portuguese frontier. But after a winter of rest, reinforcement and training, Wellington's army was stronger than ever. 100,000 men, many of them battle-hardened veterans. And for the first time, he had sufficient cavalry and artillery, while transport and medical services had also been improved. Mar that's one thing to remember as well, because I've mentioned this in other videos, that Wellington kind of had this reputation, even contemporaneously among the French, particularly among his enemies, that he was this defensive general that only fought battles from overwhelming positions of superiority. Um, but this, this kind of shows why he had to be quite defensive in Spain, because his army just did not have the numbers um, to launch these sort of grand sweeping offensives uh, like Napoleon could, you know, he had to be conservative with what he had. You know, um, one major defeat, Wellington's army could have been broken and destroyed, you know, that would have been it. So he had to be very careful about what he was doing. But this is one of the few times actually where I think at, the, at Vittoria, um, I'm not too sure, but I think they will probably find this out as we go. But I think this is one of the few battles where Wellington actually had numerical superiority. So he had, the advantage in numbers for the first time. Um, but as I've pointed out in other battles, in other videos on battles that Wellington fought, you know, um, he was just smart. He, you know, he used what he had to its greatest effect. So of course you're going to be defensive when you need to be, you know, you're not going to 
you know, war isn't about these sort of grand, sweeping, cavalier, you know, you, you know, sort of romantic um, sweeping advances, you know, that crush the enemy and things like that. That happens once in a blue moon. A lot of the time you just have to be careful with what you've got. Um, and that's what he did. And it also ignores that some of his, you know, a lot of his greatest battles, greatest achievements were ones where he fought offensively, where he was on the attack. You know, um, Wellington himself said that he thought his greatest victory was the Battle of Assay, which I believe was 1803. I may, may be wrong about that, but there was a battle that was fought in India, and his army was severely outnumbered. You know, it was outnumbered something like 10 to 1 or something like that. You know, the numerical disadvantage he was at was just insane, but he still went on the offensive. And it was that offensive that actually caught the enemy off guard. And, you know, there were other factors involved, obviously, but that just shows that he wasn't this kind of meek, you know, um, defensive general that he often gets portrayed as, um, which I think is unfair anyway. So, but let's continue. Raoul was sky high. Their chief, known to the troops as Old Nosy, was cheered wherever he went. <laughs> no prizes for figuring out how he got that nickname. I never saw the British army so healthy or so strong, Wellington informed London. In contrast, the French position in Spain was weaker than ever. Napoleon severely underestimated the threat posed by Wellington, and had just withdrawn 20,000 French troops for his own use in Germany. As commander-in-chief, King Joseph knew his forces were overstretched. Napoleon allowed him to give up Madrid, and move his capital to the more easily defended Valladolid. But withdrawing further, to a strong position like the Ebro River, was out of the question. That would send the wrong message to neutral Austria and Napoleon's wavering German allies. And so, with serious concerns, Joseph and his chief of staff, Marshal Jourdan, awaited Wellington's offensive. This video is... That's one of those instances where you get one strategic concern overriding another, because in that situation, you know, he's kind of be, he's been backed into a corner at this point. He's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Because, like I said, if he re withdraws to the Ebro River, which is easily much more defensible than where they are now, they might have a chance um, at defeating Wellington. Whether they could have done it or not, I don't know. Who knows? You know, it's one of those alternate history things. Um, but by doing that, it looks like they're, you know, they've not even fought a major battle yet and they're already retreating. So, of course, you know, Austria, which is leaning much more heavily towards the coalition at this point, is going to think, well, you know, the, their prestige is waning, you know, the the Napoleon star is setting kind of thing, so, you know, um, we'll go on the offensive now and declare war. Um, that is actually what happens anyway, but... Um, you know, it's like I say, it's just one of those rock and a hard place decisions that you often find yourself in war. So, you know, it's either way, he's lost the peninsula at this point. Sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the free to play RPG in which you build a team of champions to battle the forces of darkness. The game features 16 factions, including the Banner Lords, the first you'll encounter in campaign mode. This once proud kingdom has fallen under the influence of evil forces and turned on former allies. It'll be up to you to get to the bottom of the mystery. Banner Lord champions love plate armor and weaponry inspired by medieval Europe. The game has nearly 600 unique champions in all, each with their own skills and as beautifully detailed as these heavy duty knights. Raid's turn-based combat system is fast and intuitive, with slick animations and sound effects with a satisfying crunch. Here's Epic History TV's Band of Heroes in action, scything through hapless guards, before getting into rather more serious trouble against a Minotaur, one of many formidable big bosses. Success in combat requires skillful tactics and a balanced squad. Champions will need to level up and find rare artifacts before they can hope to survive the more challenging dungeons. There are regular updates, expansions, and a PvP arena for taking on other players. 
Use the link below to download RAID for PC or mobile now. Thank you to RAID Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Wellington's plan was for his army to advance in two wings, concentrate at Toro, then move against Joseph's forces. In the south, Murray's Anglo-Sicilian Spanish force, based in Alicante, had just repelled an attack by Marshal Suchet at the Battle of Castilla. Murray would now mount a diversionary landing on the Mediterranean coast, to coincide with Wellington's advance and prevent Suchet sending reinforcements north. Wellington had also counted on large-scale support from Spanish regular forces, of which he was, since November 1812, theoretically commander-in-chief. But the Spanish Cortes, based in Cadiz, was deeply divided, with many still highly suspicious of British motives. Cortes um, meaning court, I believe. So some people might be looking at that and think you're thinking it might relate to Cortes the Explorer, but uh, no, I think it's just I think it's just the Spanish word for court. The result was that Wellington would only receive direct support from a few reliable Spanish divisions. Fortunately, he would receive considerable Spanish support from the guerrillas, now better armed, organized, and operating in greater numbers than ever before. A large area of Valencia had effectively been liberated by El Fraile, the friar. Esposimina had captured major towns in Navarre and was currently keeping General Clozel's Army of the North busy, while Juan Martín Díaz, aka El Empecinado, was tying down large numbers of French troops near Madrid. I'm glad they show things like that, actually, because it shows that while theoretically this is the front line running down here, and you've got like the sort of coalition control here and the French control here, stuff like this, it shows just how tenuous the French control over the areas that they theoretically held actually was. Um, because yes, they might hold the major cities, but control of the countryside completely eluded them for the most part. You know, it's kind of similar to the American Revolution in that sense, in that the British could hold these major cities, but they just didn't have the numbers to control the countryside effectively. Whereas um, here, they they did have the numbers before Napoleon started peeling troops away from Spain. Um, they theoretically did have the numbers, but it was just that the guerrilla campaign they faced was so incredibly intense, you know, it was probably one of the most intense in history, really. Um, it just completely eroded their control outside of these major settlements. On the 22nd of May, Wellington bid farewell to Portugal and began his advance. Four days later, he was in Salamanca, from where he joined the northern wing of his army under Sir Thomas Graham. Joseph and Jourdan expected Wellington's main thrust to come from Salamanca, so planned to defend the line of the Douro River. But Graham's rapid advance north of the river meant they'd already been outflanked, and they ordered a retreat. By a series of brilliant marches, Wellington continued threatening the French right flank, forcing Joseph to keep falling back. Yeah, that's another good move as well, is if you can march fast enough, if you can advance fast enough, you stop the enemy from being able to take a breather. You know, this is something similar to what um, Ulysses S. Grant would do to uh, Robert E. Lee during the American Civil War. Obviously, the, that campaign was slightly different in that they were actually fighting battles, you know, pretty major battles, um, whereas this is just kind of a march and retreat um, kind of um, situation. But that's similar to what Grant did, which is that he would fight a battle, but rather than withdraw, he just kept advancing and threatening Lee's flank, which forced him to keep retreating. And he, d you know, he kept him on the back foot all the time, which is exactly what Wellington's doing here. Wellington's army was able to use small roads and mountain tracks north of the main highway, 
which the French had dismissed as impassable. But thanks to his Spanish allies, Wellington knew better. Yeah, that's a neat little point actually there, which is that a lot of the passes that the French couldn't use because of guerrilla activity, the coalition can use because the guerrillas keep it open for them. So they also have advantages of mobility in that way too. Backed by British sea power, he was also now able to switch his supply base from Lisbon to Santander, drastically reducing the length of his supply lines, another feat the French had written off as impossible. At the Ebro River, the French found themselves outflanked yet again, and fell back to Vitoria. I'd be interested to know why they considered that, um, why they had written that off as impossible, because is it just purely because of the mountains? You know, because I know obviously Spain is extremely mountainous, um, I'm guessing that's probably the reason that they considered that they wouldn't be able to use Santander as a supply base, because um, obviously Santander is on the coast. So they can, you know, at least more ships there. But um, I'm guessing it's probably, you know, the, the terrain that they considered. That's why they wouldn't be able to do it. But um, I wonder if that was also because of the activities of the Spanish guerrillas, though, because the guerrillas just kept attacking these the French supply columns in similar terrain. So maybe it was that the French favoured other terrain purely out of necessity, and that had kind of become, you know, the military zeitgeist in a way you know it had kind of blinded their thinking in some way so maybe things that were off limits to them not necessarily off limits to their enemy but because it is off limits to them they consider their enemy unable to do the same thing you know it sometimes that does happen in warfare so i wonder if that was part of the psychology too here joseph decided that he must make his stand the zadora river valley west of vitoria seemed to offer a strong defensive position. Expecting an attack from the west, French forces were drawn up in three lines. General Gazan's Army of the South formed the first line, then General Derlon's Army of the Centre, then General Rey's Army of Portugal. Joseph hoped that he could at least buy time for the vast wagon convoy assembled east of the city to get away. It contained not only military supplies, but his government's treasury. And as satirised by this contemporary British cartoon, the accumulated loot of five years French occupation of Spain, including priceless works of art, jewels and antiques. He also expected General Clausel to arrive with 20,000 reinforcements any day. However, thanks to the guerrillas, Wellington was better informed of Clausel's whereabouts than Joseph himself. Knowing that Clausel couldn't reach Joseph before the 22nd of June, he decided to attack on the 21st. Wow. The day before... Fr Talk about cutting it fine, though. <laughs> but that's just, you know, how you have to time these things. French patrols reported enemy troop movement to the north, so Reyes' troops were moved to cover any threat to the army's line of communications. Just going back to that for a quick second, though, I think that just shows how up-to-date and accurate Wellington's intelligence was from the Spanish guerrillas, though, that he could time an offensive like that within, like, one day's margin of error and know that he was comfortable doing so. Because, other, you know, if you had sort of intelligence that was maybe a few days out of date by that point, you know, it, it could be risky because you could think, well, what if they gain a day's march unexpectedly, you know? But that I think that just is a testament to how effective the Spanish guerrillas were in providing Wellington with intelligence. Apart from one division, which left to escort part of the wagon convoy to France, an odd decision that deprived the army of 4,000 men on the eve of battle. Marshal Jourdan had been bedridden with fever that day. The next morning, he reconnoitred the army's position with King Joseph. They agreed that their position was overextended and should be shortened. But by the time their orders reached General Gazan, it was too late. He was already under attack. Wellington, enjoying the advantage in numbers for once, had decided to attack in four columns across a ten-mile front. 
with General Graham's left-hand column threatening Joseph's line of retreat. It was a bold plan, with the potential to trap and destroy Joseph's army, but required careful coordination and precise timing. Fortunately, the French had not thought it necessary to destroy any of the bridges over the Zadora River, which was also fordable in several places. Look at all those bridges, though. I mean, that's just incredible that they managed to oversee that. Because what have we got here? There's nine bridges in total and several fording spots as well. So that just shows like how poor the French preparations were at this point in the war. And it goes to show like the French army has absolutely lost its edge by this point, because if you leave nine bridges intact um, that the enemy can use to cross and attack you, then what more can you really say to that? At 8 a.m., General Hill's column began its attack on the Allied right. Spanish and British troops advanced up the western heights of Puebla, driving off French skirmishers and forcing General Gazan to send reinforcements to secure his left flank. Hill's troops then seized the village of Subiana, but French cannon fire and counterattacks prevented any further advance. Convinced that Hill's attack was the main assault, and that troop movements to the north were probably a diversion, Jordan continued to send troops from the centre to reinforce the left. In a way, this is all, in fact, not in a way, it is. This is basically Napoleon's tactics that he used. You know, he used a sort of diversionary assault, but one that was strong enough to convince the enemy that that was perhaps the main attack, to peel troops away from other sectors, which would then weaken them enough to launch the decisive attack in that area. That was Napoleon's tactics down to a T. So, um... This was exactly... Oops, I didn't mean to press play then. So that just shows, I mean, not strictly original um, from Napoleon's perspective. You know, those kind of tactics had been used before in battle, but that just shows how effective those tactics actually were. And Napoleon obviously used them to great effect. Um, but it's interesting that it, just in the context of the Napoleonic Wars that the coalition are basically using the same tactics against Napoleon's armies that they had used for so many years to great success what Wellington wanted. But at 11am, he was waiting with growing impatience for his other columns to go into action. Lord Dalhousie's 7th Division, supposed to be leading the attack by the centre-left column, had got held up in the mountains. While further east, Graham's flanking move had got off to a cautious start. But seeing the size of the approaching force, General Ray decided to pull back his troops across the Zadora River. This encouraged Graham to get things moving. Colonel Longa's Spanish division advanced on Durana, held by Spanish troops loyal to King Joseph, and a bitter struggle for the village ensued. British and Portuguese infantry advanced against Camara Mayor. They were soon engaged in bloody street fighting with the French. This scene shows an attack by the 4th King's Own Regiment of Foot and the 47th Lancashire Regiment. Though they succeeded in driving the French out of the village, they could not cross its bridge over the Zadora, which was expertly covered by French guns. Some people might recognise that line from the movie Waterloo, which was actually, um, I think, was it was it Picton in that battle as well who watered that that line? I think in in that in that movie, I think I think it was. Um, he was the one where he his uniform hadn't arrived, so he fought the battle in um, like his Sunday dress, basically. You know, he had he had like the top hat and everything, which was actually the case in the real battle too. Um, but I think that's the line um, that was used in the movie Waterloo. Around noon, a Spanish peasant informed Wellington that the bridge at Tres Puentes was completely unguarded. He immediately ordered Kempt's elite light infantry brigade to dash across it and secure a bridgehead. But there was still little sign of Dalhousie's 7th Division. 
General Picton, the notoriously short-tempered commander of the fighting 3rd Division, ran out of patience. Fed up with waiting for Dalhousie, he ordered his men to advance. They charged across the Mendoza Bridge and a nearby ford, driving back light French defences. General Gazon, with his left flank pinned down at Subiana, was now about to be outflanked on his right, and had no option but to pull back his troops. Wellington's army was now crossing the Zadora River in force. Heavy fighting continued to rage on the heights of Puebla, but here the French also had to give ground to maintain the cohesion of their new line. Scottish Highlanders and Connaught Rangers, supported by riflemen and Portuguese troops, now stormed the village of Arignev, routing the defenders, who retreated southeast. And a gap began to emerge in the French centre, between Gazan's army of the south and Derlon's army of the centre. The Allied advance continued, with heavy pressure on both French flanks. Wellington's army appeared to be building unstoppable momentum, with Graham's column poised to cut off Joseph's escape. By 4pm, Wellington's army was formed up across the Zadora, ready to strike a decisive blow. But his infantry came under heavy fire from 76 French guns, blasting great holes in their ranks. Allied guns were brought forward to provide support. The biggest artillery duel of the Peninsular War began. More than 70 guns on each side. Allied skirmishers, exploiting the gap in the French centre near Gometcha, were able to work their way behind the French guns and shoot down their crews. Gazon found himself threatened on both flanks. But instead of trying to close up with Derlon to his north, on his own initiative he ordered a retreat that left Derlon's own left flank completely exposed. Around the same time, Longa's Spanish troops finally captured Durana, and rumours swept the French army that their escape route had been cut. Derlon's army of the centre fought on bravely, withdrawing to another new defensive line just one mile west of Vitoria. As well, you can't underestimate the effectiveness of rumours um, in the height of battle either. You know, if there's a rumour that your escape route has been cut, that can, even if it's false, completely unsubstantiated, it doesn't matter because, you know, people's emotions are so heightened in the heat of battle that panic can spread extremely quickly. You know, panic is like a virus. One person gets it, then sooner or later, you know, entire regiments are infected, you know, and, and it happens within minutes as well. It can happen extremely quickly. You know, if you've read any accounts of, like, medieval battles, for instance, or even battles in this um, time period too, um, you hear accounts of, like, the commander's horse being killed from under them and things like that. And that can lead to panic that their commander has actually been killed, you know, not just that their horse is dead. So, um, you know, there's so many accounts of things like that happening. You know, Battle of Hastings is probably a, a very famous example, you know. Um, uh, Duke William's horse was killed from under him and his troops thought that he was dead and they started to panic and retreat and they only stopped when he got on a new horse and had to, like, ride amongst them to show that he was still alive. So, you know, panic can spread extremely quickly. So never underestimate the power of even a rumour during the height of battle. French guns kept up a steady fire on the advancing Allied lines, but once more, the position was outflanked. Around 5.30pm, King Joseph bowed to the inevitable and ordered a general retreat. Obviously, at the time, the Spanish used the Spanish dollar, you know, um, which gave its name eventually to the US dollar. Um, just for people wondering, you know, why they're counting money in dollars. As the main road to France had now been cut by Longa's Spanish troops, 
the army would have to retreat east towards Pamplona, along a single narrow road with boggy fields on either side. Bad enough for thousands of troops and guns, but there had been no attempt to move off the army's enormous convoy of wagons earlier in the day. The result was pandemonium, as military units and artillery tried to force their way through the streets of Vitoria and the congested lanes and fields beyond. The task of forming a rearguard fell to General Reyes' Army of Portugal, which conducted an organised withdrawal covered by its cavalry. Wellington hoped that Graham's column would now be surging across the Zadora River to cut off the French army's retreat. But Graham, overestimating the enemy's strength, continued to take a cautious approach. East of Vitoria, the French retreat descended into total chaos. The single narrow road became blocked. Wagons that took to the fields got stuck and were abandoned. Allied cavalry fell upon this confused mass, spreading panic and meeting little serious opposition. King Joseph and Marshal Jourdan themselves narrowly escaped capture. Among the abandoned wagons, many civilians, including officers, wives and children, priceless paintings, jewels and furniture, and more than five million gold francs. Troops on both sides broke ranks and dived into an orgy of plundering. One British officer described the scene. About dusk, the head of our column came suddenly on some wagons which had been abandoned by the enemy. Someone called out, they are money carts. No sooner were the words uttered than the division broke as if by word of command, and in an instant the covers disappeared from the wagons and nothing was seen but a mass of inverted legs, while the arms were groping for dollars. For money it certainly was. The scene was disgraceful, but at the same time, ludicrous. <laughs> yeah, and you have to imagine as well, because ironically, um, even though the French have lost five years worth of loot from occupying Spain, and you know, some people might think, why are they trying to expend so much effort in saving that? Well, you know, it's money. They can use it to recruit new armies and pay for, you know, troops and pay for artillery and, you know, things like that. Um, they need money to, you know, have more ammunition made, you know, so they, they would need that. You know, it's not necessarily just personal wealth. Obviously, a lot of it is. Um, you know, a lot of it would have been kept for private collections and things like that, but a lot of it would also be for the state use uh, too, to pay for the, the new troops and things like that. Um, but strangely, having, you know, leaving all of that loot behind, um, it actually slowed down the Allied army because, you know, most troops, you know, at this time, they were people that were often very much down on their luck. You know, a lot of the times, a lot of the troops in the British army could have been petty criminals. You know, they could have been like pickpockets and things like that. You know, it's kind of an exaggeration when you hear that the army was recruiting like rapists and murderers and things like that. You know, um, there, there might have been a few, but by and large, it was mostly just people that just had nowhere else to go. So if you've joined the army for steady pay and to be able to live, and then you come across millions of dollars, obviously you're going to break ranks and start to loot because you want to amass enough money when the war's over because there's a very good chance that you will be demobilized and, you know, cashiered from the service kind of thing. So you're going to want to amass enough money to see you through your retirement years. And, you know, that's why a lot of troops looted because there wasn't like a, a very good or generous pension scheme at this time you know like like there is today comparatively at least anyway i think troops today are still grossly underpaid for what they do um but that's a whole other topic that i won't get into so in in effect sacrificing all of that loot actually slows down the allied army because so many have broken ranks to loot that they're not in formation to be able to pursue the enemy so even though yes king joseph uh, joseph army has been completely destroyed and defeated it's not being you know eradicated from the face of the earth you know it it could have been cut off and perhaps endured far more casualties or perhaps even large groups forced to surrender but that doesn't happen because you know the for one thing the columns coming in from the north um were delayed and held up for too long 
Um, but also, like I say, because they've broken ranks and looted, they can't mount an effective pursuit anymore. So a lot of the French troops actually end up getting away. Wellington, however, was furious. Not only did the plundering delay pursuit of the enemy, but giant sums of cash, which might have paid for his army's supplies, vanished into private pockets instead. Of 5.5 million francs, only 250,000 were ever recovered by the army. That's incredible. You know, the vast majority of that just quote unquote disappeared. You know, I'd be interested to know like what the rules and regulations were about loot at this time. You know, I'm I'm not too familiar with that because I would have thought, you know, if it's in private pockets, then they would have to have it on them, so couldn't they just be searched, you know, or anything like that? Wasn't there like an official system in place for, you know, or official rules or law or anything like that in place concerning loot um at this time? I, I don't know. Um but again this you know, looting isn't really something that was exclusive to this time, you know, even as far back as the Roman legions, you know, a lot of the time they went to war, you know, I'm not saying the Roman state declared war to get money or anything like that, because obviously wars are expensive. Um, but a lot of the time the soldiers, they would have wanted to go to war to get loot, you know, to amass these personal fortunes, uh, to see them through their retirement years. So... You know, it's, but that's, that's amazing, just how much of that just vanished, you know, into private hands. Vittoria was a great victory for the coalition. Not as crushing as it might have been, reflected in relatively light French casualties. But in the chaotic retreat that followed, the Allies did capture all but two of 153 French guns, and even Jordan's Marshal's Battle. French military power in Iberia was broken. The Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain was at an end. Joseph returned to France to face his brother's criticism. Marshal Jourdan retired from active service. Napoleon sent Marshal Soult to replace them, but even his shrewd military mind could not turn the tide in Spain. Counterattacks to relieve the French garrisons at Pamplona and San Sebastian were defeated. That autumn, Wellington began what proved an unstoppable advance across the Pyrenees and into France. In southern Spain, where Marshal Suchet remained undefeated, the disaster at Vitoria forced him also to withdraw towards the frontier, leaving behind just a few isolated garrisons. After a bitter five-year struggle, the Allies had brought the Peninsular War to the Spanish, their War of Independence, to a victorious conclusion. It had been a long, hard road, steeped in blood and suffering. The alliance between Britain and Spain had been particularly treacherous to navigate. But ultimately, both nations had fought together with Portugal to drive the French back across the Pyrenees. New research provides a clearer insight than ever into the huge attrition of French manpower in Iberia. An estimated total of 260,000 lives lost. Three quarters died of sickness. Of approximately 66,000 deaths from combat, 43% were in actions against Spanish regular forces. 38% fighting British-led armies, and 19% fighting guerrillas. By contrast, British military deaths are estimated at 52,000, Portuguese 15,000, with many more thousands of civilian deaths, while Spanish deaths are unknown, though the country as a whole may have lost as many as half a million lives in five that just shows, though, how effective those guerrillas were, because of all the troops, the French troops that died in combat, 
one in five died fighting the guerrillas. That can't be under you know that can't be underestimated as to how effective that was. And it's not about just killing them either. It's about tying them down. It's about preventing them from advancing because if they do, they risk being cut off or you know encircled and things like that. So it's not just about killing them that's that gets them to win, you know. So, but just look at that though, because more troops would die of sickness until I think about the First World War. You know, I think that was perhaps one of the first major conflicts where more people actually died as a result of combat than, and that was just purely because of the industrialized nature of war. It wasn't really until World War Two when the invention of things like penicillin actually kind of pretty much eliminated the risk of dying from disease in combat, uh, from in, in war rather. Um, obviously it still happened, but it didn't happen to nearly the same extent that it did in wars like this, where, I mean, look at that, three quarters dead just from sickness, you know. Um, just, But that's just an astonishing casualty rate, you know, over a quarter of a million in five years. That's just, incre that's just you know, that's just an insane casualty rate, even today. You know, even in even in conflict today, when conflict today is much more lethal than it was back then, um, that's just an astonishing rate of death. Five years of war and occupation. For Napoleon, this disaster had been an unnecessary and largely self-inflicted wound, an intervention born of arrogance and false assumptions, with dire strategic consequences. But as the Napoleonic Empire crumbled in Spain, an even greater struggle neared its climax in Central Europe, where Napoleon faced the most powerful coalition of his enemies yet. If the French Emperor was victorious in Germany, Wellington might soon be scrambling back across the Pyrenees. The fate of Europe was about to be decided at the Battle of Leipzig. which we will cover next time. Undoubtedly, that is the next video. So uh, we will definitely be taking a look at that and finishing this series off. So again, nearing the end, um, I think there's only a few more videos to go. Um, and then after that, like I say, we'll be doing the video on his marshals. But uh, please comment below um, anything that you learned from this video, you know, either from my reaction or the original video. Let's get some discussions going. Um, but we will continue the series absolutely, so please keep watching, please make sure you're subscribed. Again, please check out Patreon, um, support me on there if you can. Uh, there are several tiers open, you know, some of them are very little uh, per month, so please definitely consider that because it would help me out massively, and I'll be able to create more videos for you guys. So, um, but in the meantime, thank you so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one.